The um, cool. So yeah. So I'm uh, Christopher Alberg, uh, co-founder and CEO of Recruited Future. I'm going to talk about threat intelligence. And I realize that there's a few people in the room who probably know more about threat intelligence than I do, but you know, that's okay. And I'm, maybe there's some people who have never heard of threat intel, and we'll sort of think about how we can bridge those two. And I'm going to put that in the context of speaking about dragons, but which implies China here. So we'll, um, hopefully you'll enjoy that. Um, just quickly about myself. I'm Swedish by background, but live in the U.S. since a long time. You'll hear that on my voice. Uh, I've got a soldier. I wrote a PhD thesis on how to visualize large databases. I ran a company called Spotfire for a long time that came out of my, my background there. So I'm sort of a data visualization guy more than a security guy, but I guess over the last five years, I've sort of become a security guy, one way or the other. I don't know. I like French wine. <laughs> so, any, anybody see anything wrong in that last picture? Dude, I was hoping for you guys to throw tomatoes at me because that was a burgundy wine, but uh, <laughs> come on. it's too early for those sort of jokes. All right. That was, that was funny, wasn't it? No. Yes. <laughs> All right. I was hoping for it. So what is threat intelligence? So the cool thing, I got a new colleague here in France, Jean-Pierre, uh, you know, this is our first uh, Record Future uh, colleague in France, so that's exciting. So I sent him an email and I said, Hey, Jean-Pierre, uh, tell me, how do I say threat intelligence in France? And, you know, the answer I get, sort of the classic French, it's, it's uh, compliqué. You know, it's compliqué. <laughs> I asked one of my board members, uh, who is Bernard Liato. He ran a company called Business Objects and sold that to SAP. Very, you know, very famous French software guy. And, and he just did this when I asked him. I know, I, it was for him, it was trying to say business intelligence in French. It was sort of saying, yeah, it's, it's, I'm pussy. You know, it's just like <laughs> uh, complicated. So, so um, I think we're just going to stick with threat intelligence. And, uh, come tell me afterwards if you have a better word. But um, sort of the good sign, I think. Yeah. Um, so I'll do a few Game of Thrones uh, analogies. I don't know. Is it popular in France? Is it? Yeah. So, so, so one way to think about um, threat intelligence is, is sort of use the wall analogy. Now, coming out of America, when you speak about a wall, then you think about that Trump guy and his wall. I promise you I'm not talking about his wall. So put that aside. So I think of threat intelligence as being, if you think in security and we have a company, an organization, what, what have you, they have a perimeter, and you know that's the wall. And the role of threat intelligence is sort of dare to look beyond that wall and try to collect a little bit of intelligence that we could actually use in defending that wall. Now, typically, there's not a lot of people doing that, and it's pretty lonely uh, to, to do it. We, we just ran our user conference in, in D.C., where we actually had 250 people or so who are now sort of doing threat intelligence, and that was very exciting. But, you know, there's like two guys from one company, three guys from another, and, you know, so, so it's, it's still a lonely sort of new profession and, and, and so on. And then when you go out there and you go look and venture into the Russian underground or what have you, that's lonely. So, you know, but ultimately what you're trying to do is, you know, you want to be Varus in, in, in I don't know, maybe not something you get really excited about being Varus. Uh, but uh, if you want to be Varus and sort of the guy who, have my little birds will tell me everything. And, and, you know, you want to be that guy who sort of collect information and pull it all together. And, and you know, I like to use the military word is sort of all source intelligence. You want to get all kinds of intelligence, you know, whether it, yeah, come back to that. But you want to get all kinds of intelligence being open sources or dark sources or technical sources and pull that together in a way that you can actually put it to work. So that's the end of the, the Game of Thrones stuff. But uh, you want to be Boris, so keep that in mind. All right. So today I'll speak about nation state stuff. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, tracking or you know, threat actors of various thought, thought I would say kinds, we could think about hacktivists. We could think about just hackers. You know, fooling around. We could think about uh, criminals, and there's plenty of, of criminals in, in you know wherever you are, Russia, or and they're in any, every country. But we always think about Russian underground. You know the the scammers of all kinds of sorts. Today, we'll, we'll think about nation states. And, and, you know, this could be the Five Eye guys. It could be the Israelis. I'm Swedish by background. It could be the FRI, FRI guys. It could be the Russians. It could be the Chinese. It could be the French. You know, even the French, they do this stuff. In fact, it's become such that I think it's fair to say that when intelligence services want to collect 
information, even the classically oriented human places that people who have spies, you know, like good old spying sort of approaches, even there, doing things via computers has become the primary means of collection or, or at least one of them. So today we'll sort of focus in on these guys, the Chinese MSS, which is their CIA, if you want. It's a little bit different, and, and we'll talk about that, but there, and there are some sort of interesting angles to it. So the, the trick to understanding government agencies, I believe, is to not just think about them as a bunch of hackers, because they're not. They're different. You know, so a hacker might wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to go scam you know, uh, Apple and try to get some money for them, or I'm going to go hack this website. So he may have, or he might have a boss, and he might have, the, you know, like, but, but in reality, there's not a lot of bureaucracy around, around this hacker. If you think about, welcome, you get to do push-ups because you're late. No, no. Uh, maybe not. No. Um, the, the, the specific thing about government agencies is that they have tasking. So somebody tells them what to do. They have a budget, they got a time schedule. They may have very long time horizons. They may be told to get into something, even if it takes a year to get to it. So there are a lot of things that become specific if you think about a government agency. So here, you know, China, Xi Jinping, he says, uh, Mr. Xi here repeats China's pledge to promote equitable global internet governance. <coughs> Sort of a big sense, <coughs> while upholding sovereignty or the right of countries to determine how they want to manage the internet. This will be a very important sentence, and, and won't expect you to remember all these words. But I will actually one of those tie back. Not like the other. Say again. One of those things is not like the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it's, we're going to see how it gets complicated. <laughs> so then, when he says that, that means that, for example, MSS gets put to work. Uh, MSS is a very important thing for him, and we can talk about that at length. But then eventually the MSS guys will task various sort of groups, and there might be people who work in their building, or people who work down the street. Now, this intelligence, intelligence is, is in all countries do that. Sometimes they do their work themselves, or they put others to work. That happens in Sweden or in France, or, you know, like, there's nothing funky. But, you know, maybe in information security, there's more of that. You know, you'll send somebody to work. Then they go target somebody, whether it's a French, you know, Navy uh, organization or whoever, whoever they might go after. Now, they're going to do that trying to take advantage of vulnerabilities and, and, you know, try to use various tool sets. And eventually, they'll leave, you know, traces behind. The reason I always try to make this point here, and maybe for some of you this is completely 100% obvious, but by understanding the sort of how it all ties together, we can sort of understand that, you know, when we see some traces on our networks, we, you know, if we can tie that back to what tool sets that are used, we should be able to sort of either, you know, figure out like who is trying to come after us. And if we can figure out who is coming out after us, now we could actually use that to not just track individual, uh, you know, individual sort of indicators for defense. Maybe we can actually say we want to defend against this, you know, largely against this sort of tool sets. We want to patch against these vulnerabilities. We can sort of have a whole different sort of approach to how we defend ourselves. Now, I'm not going to say there are any easy buttons in, in all of this, but let's try to, as we go through this, understand the whole chain of, of things. And, and do remember this little quote here. So, you know, I will say very little bit about recorded future today, but I will say that our job, what we do, is that we collect from open sources and closed sources and technical sourcing and try to organize gobs of data. We run more or less like a thousand Amazon servers at large where we collect information, try to organize that in clever ways, using everything from basic statistics to, I guess, you know, these days everybody wants to talk about machine learning, so machine learning AI sort of techniques, and then get that to people. And so on. that's sort of all I will say, but I'll, I'll come back and make a couple of connections to it. But let's with that dive into to China. So, and specifically again, MSS, and I'll talk about how this becomes sort of an infinite loop, I'll call it, for companies who are trying to do business in China, which a lot of people are, even ourselves maybe. So, it's tricky business. Um, so, the first sort of point that I will try to make is that many, maybe a few of you have heard of these guys, APT3, sort of a known actor out there, it gets to be called Buckeye and uh, Gothic Panda, you know, these people love to put the names on these so that they sound very fancy. Um, well, the first sort of point here I'm going to try to prove out to you is that APT3 is the same as MSS. 
same as their, you know, again, the Chinese CIA. Now, I could probably spend a whole day on this, and, and so I'll give you the four and a half minute sort of version, maybe it will be two and a half minute version, but we can talk more about it in the break. And I know there's a few people here who have spent probably more on time on this than I have, So, but it's a, it's a fun subject. So the first sort of thing to known here is uh, this piece of malware called Peerpee that APT3 probably has been using for about a decade in, in their various sort of operations around the world. And you dig into the domains that have been registered by that, there's, you get to this guy Dong Hao. Uh, this is when people still would you know, use their names on, on malware registry or domain registration. People are getting smarter around that and you know hiding better. But it turns out that this guy Dong Hao, he's the registered um, shareholder with one other guy of a company called Boisec. Boisec, if we spell it out, is going to Boy Information Technology Company. Um, so that's sort of interesting. So we started getting a connection from this piece of malware to this domain registration to this company, Boisec. Boisec, we also found open sourcing in, in Chinese language, completely digging around in open sources. We were able to show that Boisec has a joint lab with this thing called Guangdong IT Sec. And so it turns out that Boisec is one of the, in Chinese, active defense companies. So, you know, sort of a penetration and active defense, which sort of implies, you know, pretty aggressive activities. Um, and they have this joint lab with what's called Guangdong IT Sec. Guangdong IT Sec, in turn, um, we also found nice open sources pointing how they advertise themselves to be a field arm in Guangdong for uh, what's called CNTSEC, Syntec, which is the China Information Technology Security Evaluation Center. These are the guys, when, if you've heard about how, for example, Microsoft gave their source code to Chinese MSS for code inspection. It's a bad thing. They should never have done that. But these are the guys who get, got their hands on it. So these guys are the Guangdong uh, field arm of Simtech. And so now what we then are able to do is to sort of do the, take the connection from PRP to APT3 to this company Boisec to Guangdong IT Sec, all the way up to Simtech. And now we are in MSS, with their long academic sort of uh, history of, of documenting the, that Syntec is nothing but a part of MSS. It ends up being a pretty nice sort of connection uh, of things here. And it's very classic MSS behavior of using third parties like this Boisec as a way for execution, which again, intelligence agencies do it all over the world, but it's more so in, in, you know, in MSS behavior. So that's pretty nice. Now, you know, you say, okay, what are we going to do with that? That's interesting, but all right. So now how, what does that mean for me? And I actually do think we'll now talk a little bit about what I think what that actually means. So China has just instituted a new cybersecurity law. Uh, so that's interesting. You've probably have read about or heard about that over the last year. Uh, now, there are many security laws around or cybersecurity laws around the world. Um, in fact, in Europe, you know, GDRP is coming up as a cybersecurity law. And, and uh, you know, I think there's a talk about that this afternoon even. So now, if, you know, GDRP can be painful, especially if you work in information security. Calling kinds of painful, and that could probably drive money also, like consultancy fees and so on. But there, there are painful aspects to it and so on. But ultimately, it's set up to protect information for, you know, us as consumers. You know, and, and, you know, even to the degree if, uh, you know, CW here is sort of done th something stupid, ends up in some newspaper, but then he wants to get rid of himself. He could be, you know, right to be forgotten and sort of force that. And, and so all kinds of goodness is sort of to protect consumers. Now, when you dig, it, dig, dig into the Chinese version of the same, you know, it has some of the same standardized collection and use of PII, personally identifiable information and so on. But though where it gets complicated is that this law is ultimately about Chinese government's access to personal information or personal information. So quite different. You know, it's ultimately about them having direct access to source code or data or networks, which is important, networks, as well as being the ones who take it, take in all the vulnerability data that is collected. So they get basically all of it, and they even set up an informant system around this. So MSS here, or in fact, I'll make this point here then, that it's actually MSS 
who runs and administers this law in China. So now we've established that MSS is, is you know, APT3 running sort of offensive cyber operation, but they're also the ones who are administering, running the cybersecurity law. I guess it's pretty complicated. And it's also interesting that they actually run the Chinese vulnerability database called CNNVD. So you've probably seen the, in the US, it's called NIST, who runs the, what's called MVD, National <coughs> Vulnerability Database. Anybody of you here, sort of a pen tester of some sort, will have run and seen that. In China, they run the CNNVD. So we're going to take a quick look at that. So obviously, MSS could take advantage of this information, all kinds of things. And they, that's what they did with getting their hands on the yeah, Microsoft source code. That's why they've sort of been able to hack every Tibetan monk nine times over, you know, taking apart Microsoft Office in every way there is, uh, and, and uh, not so good. So this, we believe, creates sort of an infinite loop. And, you know, I won't try to do the uh, definition. I, uh, you know what an infinite loop is. It's something without an end condition could end up in a couple of different ways. But you, you end up with the sort of the same thing here where under you know, the, this, this law, the Chinese cybersecurity law, if you do business in China, you're required to hand over uh, your data or provide access to your data or your networks in China. Uh, even source code and the people you have to give it to is MSS that we've proven out to be their CIA here. And the, <clears throat> so you have to sort of cooperate with all requests for user data, all of this sort of stuff. But if at the same time you want to comply with GD GDRP in Europe or the equivalent laws in the US, you just can't do both. So, so it gets really complicated. It's, it's to satisfy <clears throat> both law sets here may even be impossible. I think that's sort of something that has not been really understood so far. And for people who are looking to business in China, which you know, we even record a future, this gets very complicated. So something to keep in mind. Now, question is, can we actually learn something from these guys? So it turns out, and this is results that we published on Thursday, uh, so just two days, 48 hours ago. So I'm sort of excited to be, this is the first conference where we're presenting this. We put this out on our website on, on Thursday. So can we use CMBD here as an idiot util here? Uh, doing a lot of uh, <laughs> Leninistic uh, connection. And so it actually turns out they're, they're very efficient at vulnerability data management. So we have long studied the US vulnerability management system and seen it to be slow. So it turns out that the US MBD takes about 33 days to publish data on a new vulnerability. Sometimes it's fast. So, for example, for the new uh, oh, the Apache Stretch vulnerability, the U.S. government figured out that that was very important. It took three days to get that out. That was remarkably fast. He said they're regular 33. For Dirty Cow, another you know well-known new vulnerability, it took the U.S. government 20 days to get that information out. The Chinese did it in two. So, in average, the Chinese do this in 13 days. The U.S. takes 33 days. Big difference. And so as somebody who's doing defense, we, we would recommend that you should actually look at this data. It's, it's fast and it's, it's actually, and then the critique that we, when we publish this over the last couple of days here, of course, the, the, the NVD guys, the US government, they were like, yeah, but we have better quality, blah, 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 which of course, you know, it's when you're slow, you're going to claim higher quality. But, <laughs> the, uh, and, but we actually spent a lot of time looking at this Chinese data and at large, at large, it's actually of high quality. So, you know, we can, yes, if you're a hacker, you can take advantage of this. And if you're a defender, we think this is worthwhile mentioning, or not, it's worthwhile following. So, so they, they do a nice job. We can talk about this at length too. I think there's a French version of this database also. There's a Japanese version uh, or of the, the equivalent. So we're going to go benchmark against other countries as well uh, and, and see, you know, try, we'll do more work on this. Now, there's a but. There's, a, there's always a but. <laughs> so, oh, and by the way, you can download this report. It's for free. This, you know, go to this uh, recordfuture.com slash Chinese vulnerability reporting. You can download it. You don't even need to remember that. You'll find it on the website. So the dragon is winning. Um, now, so now it gets tricky. So we were sort of thinking that, wondering, like, if sometimes these guys sit on these vulnerabilities. Do they sort of just hold on them? 
So we look at this Shanghai Adapts that's, you know, without going all the kinds of details, it's a, it was an implant put into Android that was used in, in uh, tracking protesters in Hong Kong. So here, November 2016, the New York Times reported on this. It was known before, but that was the, sort of the first open source piece on this. Secret backdoor in some US phones sent data back to China. Boom. You know, and people at Google and Android got all upset, as you can imagine. So turns out that uh, here, the MBD, the US MBD, publishes that pretty quickly, uh, you know, just a, uh, like a month later or something, with CVSS score and all those. In this case, the Chinese sat on it for 236 days. So, yes, they can be sinister. Uh, so, uh, you know, they may be fast in general, but in then some cases still sit on them. So we're going to come back and write a report. And, you know, it turns out that, for example, on Adobe, which we know that the Chinese love to hack Adobe Flash in every way there is, in Adobe or on Adobe, they're much slower than normal. So we can sort of go down the list of vendors and see where are they statistically slow? And I love this. I'm sort of a data guy. So I'm saying at the beginning, it's much fun when you can actually use statistics to, you know, you can, you can always argue about a case of one or two, but when you can use statistics and, and actually do this stuff, it ends up being a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, so with that, you know, I sort of think about all this stuff as, you know, uh, what's the game, point relier, I think in French, you know, like this is what we're trying to do. You know, these pictures are, you know, it's, it's connecting the dots here. You know, you can sort of many times see what's going on, but, you know, the role of threat intelligence is trying to figure that out. So what we do with Recruited Future is try to figure out, like, if I'm going to track what Xi Jinping is saying or being able to, in real time, organize all the world knows about MSS or APT3 or PRP or particular vulnerability or down to an individual domain. We try to, in real time, collect all that data and get that to the defender so they can basically do a better job of connecting the dots in real time, which is sort of what, you know, anybody of you who worked on the defensive side, that's what, what we're trying to do. And, and, you know, we put this to work in threat intelligence or, you know, so or if people want to use this in their SOC or incident response and, and so on, it could be enriching IOCs or determining the severity of a vulnerability, so on and so forth. So, and it could be something you do standalone in Record Future, or maybe you're a Splunk user and you want to do this inside Splunk, and all of those sort of cases are, are possible. So, if you want to know more about this, go to recordfuture.com. We published a lot of research around APT3 and China and the whole sort of Chinese information security apparatus. So, there's three, four key blogs on that subject that I would recommend you check out. We also like our recent North Korea stuff that we've been putting out there, it's all very timely and, and juicy. Uh, feel free to contact me, uh, Recruit Future, or C at Recruit Future down here at the bottom. Uh, our new colleague here, Jean-Pierre, if you want to speak, prefer to speak to a French guy, you can get to him. Uh, JP Catlin at Recruit Future. And uh, that's it. So, any questions? <coughs> Make sense? I got a question. Um, we're, so, you mentioned. Um, you know, uh, Adobe being one of those that they sat on. Were there other, any other vendors that kind of stood out aside from Adobe that, that uh... you know, uh, so, so again, we we're trying to be a little bit careful about not putting that out too early. But no, so Adobe was the one that stood out. Microsoft, there, for example, um, they, there's a couple of Chinese vendors that they're better at, no surprise. And, and that's probably not sinister. It's probably just because they have better data flow around that. Google and Oracle and a few others, it's very similar sort of thing. But there were a few others that stood out. But uh, I think Adobe and Microsoft were the ones that sort of stood out at the, at the top. So but we'll be back with this sort of the full analysis on that and uh, do, do that in a really fashion. It's kind of a information warfare fail that they're having that lag and calling out attention to that uh, proclivity for using those particular. Bits. You mean the Chinese? Yeah. Sort of the, yeah. No, it is. But it, but it, and I think this is the point that why you know I hate to use the word big data, but you know like people don't think that it's possible to observe this. It turns out that this Chinese database, it's, it's, uh, it's open source. Just go to right now, it's there. It tends to go up and down. 
It's very, so it's hard to get to, sort of like it's, it's technically open source. It's only in Chinese and so on. So it took us a lot of work to download. You know, it's about 100,000 American you know, CVs in the American database. There's about 100,000. Actually, a remarkable parity between the two. We think that Chinese backed into by downloading the American first one to sort of just get up to parity. But the, even in the ongoing data flow, it's pretty much parity. Um, the, but uh, it's, I don't think they sort of thought about the idea that somebody would download the whole thing and start doing analysis on it. So, uh, the, you know, and I think there, there's a lot of stuff in the world that intelligence agencies, you know, they tend, you know, people who are in OPSEC sort of think about OPSEC, they tend to think more about like, how do I do things, you know, and keep myself secret. But, you know, when I put the whole organization under observation, I can find things that even if people are brilliant at the individual case, they may not. So. Are there other statistically significant lags in other national vulnerability databases that might be influenced by their intelligence apparatus? So we think there are. You know, and to be honest, even if I'm, I'm obviously sort of sound American here, I bet you we want to go look for the same thing in the American one. You know, like, yeah. uh, you know, I think in America this reports into NIST and, you know, it's, it's a little harder for it than, but who knows? Let's go find out. Uh, there is, you know, the Japanese one is there, so that'd be a good one to benchmark against. You could imagine maybe there's something being in Southeast Asia versus U.S. makes it different, but you know, or, and I do, I don't know, I would love to talk to anybody about that. I, I think there's a French uh, vulnerability database and there's, there's not a Russian one, there's not a British one, but you know, we'll go find other resources like this. You know, another one would be go to all the certs around the world and see how fast they are at reporting things. So, you know, like the, making, putting intelligence agencies on notice is a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> we've done this before, before with the Iranians and, you know, they're tracking them at, when, and once you people do, you know, do sort of pattern of life analysis, that people, when you do pattern of life of tracking a bad guy, an individual terrorist or sort of an individual organization, that's one thing. But when you do it to a whole agency that is not used to be observed, it's, it can be fun. So. Yes, yeah, so you are saying it's difficult to do business in China, but at the same time you said that you are trying to work there. So what is the solution? So so we you know we're very early and and so we we had like one client that I don't think I don't know if there's a really good solution. I know we talked about this last night. Uh, there's if you really want to, I think you could probably come up with very complicated technical solutions to sort of avoid this, or you may sort of have to just say. We're, we're, we will have to work with it, and, and we will have to provide information to the Chinese. Microsoft obviously gave their damn source code, and you know we're not going to give our source code to the Chinese. But you know that I think you know, this, and I think this is maybe something that's going to happen around the world. The countries are going to, under the auspice of information security, are going to say, "Look, I, you need to provide access to your data centers. Provide access to," and and uh, I think we're in for a very interesting next ten, ten years on this. So. I, I, I do not have a, a good, simple solution to that. Yeah, I was going to say, that's an interesting topic. I've worked with clients that have had uh, physical client operations in China, as well as clients that are, that are building um, retail or, or other operations in China. And the difficulty that you, that you overcome, there are technical solutions that you can leverage from the SARs to be able to do data, data segregation from an analytics perspective. But the weirdest thing is, particularly if you're building physical plant or manufacturing operations in China, one of the biggest things if you're part of the considered part of critical infrastructure, they have to come in and do a physical analysis of the entire factory. And that during that two to six week dark period, the MSS gets full access to the entire operation. So in the past organizations that, that I have worked with, essentially they'll go in and uh, you'll find out weeks, months, years later, that the equipment that you originally placed in has been fully replaced from the motherboard down, but the entire box uh, is still the original box, but the motherboard down is, is replaced with uh, uh, Chinese state actor uh, uh, hardware. Uh, it's just part of the physical aspect of how you do business there. So it's finding ways to be able to segregate the information and yet meet their legal requirements without <laughs> <laughs> without violating your information security, uh, you know, on the continent or in, or in the states or wherever else you have to be, it's a very unique situation. Yeah, and, uh, and I think we should not be sort of um, what do you want to call it uh, naive about it. This happens in other countries too. Yeah, you know, like exactly. it happens there everywhere. But I think you know, so again, look, even little Sweden probably does the same thing when it's necessary. But 
it's just at a whole different scale and the laws and everything are like so it's, it's going to be very complicated because obviously very few companies can say look i'm just going to stay away from china you know like so it's 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 tricky was there another question here no okay all right very good thank you